Basically, we didn't do, I didn't learn very much about what key you're supposed to be in and what, how many sharps and flats. So it didn't, it didn't really click in for me until I started using it, until I started playing with singers and having to figure out what key I was in so I wouldn't play any notes that disagreed with what they were doing. And then I started to understand, but theoretically it's kind of, I find it a bit of a drag. It's kind of tedious, you know, to work it mm -hmm. out. But I do, I will tell you what the rules are. So first of all, you have the order, or sorry, the number of sharps or flats in a key. All right, that's the first thing that you got to determine. Now, on the fiddle, it's kind of nice because the fiddle is, is set up in fifths. And that's how the number of sharps or flats in a key kind of progresses. So, for instance, on the G string, we got the key of G, which has one sharp, F sharp, okay? On the D string, we have two sharps, F and C. On the A string, we have three, F, C, and G, and, uh, and that's it for A major. And then for E major, we have four, and it's a pain played in that key. Okay, because we have uh, F, C, G, and D, which means that you can't play your D string, and you have to play a stretched third finger on the A string, which is unusual, right? Okay, and it goes on from there. Every time you go another fifth above the note that you're talking about, that adds another sharp to the key signature, okay? And so the fifth after E would be B, Bob major. And that is a real tricky one. That's got five sharps, okay? Now, that's how you get the number of sharps that are in your key. And like I said, on the fiddle, it's not that hard, and especially since we only deal with a few keys, and so you can memorize them really quickly and easy, right? Uh, but then you need to know which sharps they are, okay? And there's a little rhyme. Father Charles goes down and ends battle, all right? That's the order of the sharps. And then there's the flats as well. And everything I just described to you, you can also do in the flat keys, all right? So G minor has two flats, D minor has three and on like that, okay? Or no, sorry, no, you can't, it doesn't work with the fiddle with the flat keys. I'll have to, I'll, I'll explain the flat keys when we start to get into the flat keys because you really don't deal with them until you've been playing for a little while, okay? But for the sharp keys, that's how you get the number of sharps. And for, for the order of the sharps, it's Father Charles goes down and ends battle. So if you have one sharp, it's just F Father. If you have two sharps, it's Father Charles. See that? Two of them. If you have three, it's Father Charles goes. If you have four, it's Father Charles goes down. You see how that works? Mm -mm. Okay, now that's theoretically how you're supposed to figure out your key signatures. But like I said, I don't really do all that math. I just do it with the shape of my hand because of practice. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I know that G major has, has the lower two on the A string and the E string. I just know that from practice. And when you look at your hand a little bit, you see what notes you're actually playing. Now you know your key and what notes you can play. See that? It's very simple, actually. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. And the skill will build. The more you use it, the more you look at a piece of music and try to figure out what key it is, or hear a piece of music, play something along with it, try to figure out what key it is, then the, the stronger you'll get. And, and you, you know, most people uh, get pretty good at it. They can identify, especially like I said, we're only ever playing in the fiddle key, so you only have four or five keys to really get to know. Okay? Yeah. Thanks. yeah. Anybody else want to play something? No? Sherry's going to. I can tell. You gotta unmute though. Here, I'll, uh, I'll unmute you. Oh, there you go. All right, we'll play the first part of the swallow tap. Oh, excellent. I'll play all the second part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, Sherry, that's great. Now, I'm going to tell you, you might have gone really, really slow, snail's pace, and you might have had a couple of times when you had to stop. But other than that, you did everything right. <laughs> Good intonation. So I got my tuner on here, old sleepy tuner over here that only wakes up when you're out of tune. And he was awake for most of it, but only slightly, just very slightly, uh, either mostly on the flat side for, for the most part, and sometimes a little bit on the sharp side, okay? But I'm talking about tiny bit. You're well within the ballpark and it's good. You're also moving your bow nice and confidently. I know that it's that you're kind of like, uh -huh, and it could be better, but it's you have a good start. So, and what I also liked is you're using a good consistent amount of bow for each note. And that's for all you guys, it's really important at this point to play you know, if you're going to use your whole bow, that's great. That's always a great goal. So you use your whole bow for each note. Try not to get shorter and shorter or short change some or whatever. So that was really good. And keep doing it just like that. Slow is better. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. All right. If anybody else wants to play something, that'd be great. Otherwise, we'll uh, get started because I think this is all of us because the, the girls, Lena and Shona, are, I don't think, going to be here tonight. I think Shona said she'll try, but she's got something going on. Anyways, anybody else want to play something? Anything? Yeah, I want to play it too, the, the Swallowtail. All right, let's hear it. That's great. All right, starts on the three. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. So yeah, same thing. Like you played everything right. You had one stagger, but everybody has a stagger. No big deal. I never worry about those. Like forgetting what note comes next or whatever. That is not really my concern. That's just remembering the tune or practicing it more. It's no big deal. But what I liked was, again, same as Sherry, good consistent bows. You got your up ups in there, which was just great. Uh, and pretty good intonation as well. I'm watching the tuner, not far off, you know. Remember, it's all about being in the ballpark at this point. That's what you can, that's what you want to hope for right now, is getting on the dartboard. All right? <laughs> so that's great, guys. Very good. Okay, so shall we get warmed up with the old G, uh, well, we'll do all of our scales first, all right? Oh, wait. Let's do our bowing first. Okay? We'll do our long bows. We'll do our down, up, up, down, up, up. We'll do some jiggle, and we'll do some in, in, in circles, okay? All right, everybody's muted, that's great. So we'll start with a down bow on the G, and then an up bow. Ready, and we're gonna do it in time, so it's gonna be, gonna be kind of like one, two, down, two, kind of like that. Okay, ready, and...
Now, everybody getting a decent sound there? Anybody having problems getting their sound? Now's the time to talk about it. And if you are getting a decent sound and you're getting pretty good at it, the, your main concern is going to be timing. Make sure, making sure that you're timing your bows that it goes along with what I'm doing. Okay? Let's try that one more time and then we'll move on after that. We'll do the uh, down, up, up after that. Okay? Ready? And... Okay, that looked much better. Now, of course, I can't hear you, but I can see all your bows, and it's incredible to, incredible to me that all you guys are sitting in different parts of the city, and you're all moving your bows at the same time. That's in, It's just insane. So, but anyway, very good. So now, let's go through all the permutations of bowing that come after that, all right? Just on these four strings. So we're going to do down, up, up. Ready, and... I feel like we should do that again because that was kind of confusing. So we'll do two of those patterns on each string. All right. And now we were moving pretty good there for a while in the middle. Try to make sure you're aiming for that middle part of your bow uh, when you go for when you go to stop it. Okay. Try to try to aim right for the middle. Let's do it again. A one, two, three, and. Okay. Now, is there anybody have I'd love actually, you know what? I'd love to hear somebody doing that. How about you, Nancy? And I'm excited about your new fiddle. I'm excited too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, okay. So
Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, now that's really, really sounding good. You got the right idea. You're using a consistent amount of bow. Um, when you want to get your up bow started, do you notice how it's a kind of a soft start? Yeah, it's screechy. Yeah. yeah, and it's because there's no weight up there. And if you don't oh, do... Oh, here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So when you go to start your up bow. So because there's no weight, it kind of has this kind of start. You hear that? Yeah. So you got to you gotta give it a little nudge to get it started. See that? That was a good start. You hear that? Nice clean start. I do. I do. And okay. I can feel myself put purposely putting some weight on, on it. Perfect. Instead of letting it find it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. Because when you let it find it, it takes a, a few inches. <laughs> yeah. And you want that. So that's really good. Now, when you're stopping, it's kind of the same idea. You kind of. You kind of let those fingers, the, the fingers want to dig in like that when you stop, just like the cab of the car wants to move forward and you put on the brakes, and you just kind of let it a little bit. See that? And it actually can give you a clean stop if you really pay attention to how much it's digging in. And then it can help you get started too. See that? Sometimes I get the bounce. Oh, the bounce is, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, but, you know, it's, I'll tell you about the bounce. So give that up bow a try. Really good. I, I can, really good. You hearing that? I can, I can hear the difference, or yeah. feel the difference, too. Yeah. yeah. That's good, and that's actually it's a good point. Now, I'm, li I'm listening to your fiddle. Nancy here wants to get a new fiddle, which is pretty cool. Um, and I'm listening to what you got there, and I found it very funny that you said that Long and McQuaid perhaps wasn't the best place to buy a violin. And you are totally correct. They have nothing there, and and the people okay. that work there have no idea about anything. Um, uh, and they don't even have the kind of rosin I like. And once I bought a set, no. And once I bought a set of strings there, and they're kind of expensive strings. And because they don't sell that many sets of those expensive strings there, they sold me a dead set of strings because strings have a shelf life. They don't, sure. they don't last on the shelf forever and ever. They, they will die on the shelf. So I bought these dead strings, and I thought I was going out of my mind. And then when I got new strings. My fiddle was working again. So I don't think yeah. too much of buying stuff like that at Long and McQuaid. But George yeah. Heinel is a really good uh, place. So is the Sound Post. But, uh, you know, we'll talk more about it. There's so much to talk about with vi buying a violin, especially at the early yeah. stages. I have no context, so thank you very much. That yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. And I, yeah. Should, I, I should also qualify, though, that uh -huh. traditionally, you know, beginners, or, well, mostly kids in those days, were made to play on junk. And the reason being is because if you can make that piece of junk sound decent and get a tune rattling out of it, when you get a decent fiddle, it's gonna be like driving a Cadillac after your jalopy. <laughs> and you're gonna fly down the road and be like, whoa, this is great, you know? So I should, I always like to point that out because that's kind of the old way. Like I had an old crappy old Chinese shingle until I was like 15 or 16. Yep. Okay. Yeah, well, and, and I, I appreciate from, from guitar buying that I don't, it's top of the line is not what, what I'm looking for. I'm right. just looking for something that would be comfortable for me. So uh, knowing that I'm not traveling too much with it, <laughs> there, there won't be too much of that. Oh, for but, sure. But, um, and you're yeah. probably going to get something like a, like a nice Czech or German violin, like, you know, say maybe in a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar range that's going to yes. serve you. Like, it's not the best. So you're still going to have to work to get a sound out of it, but it will serve yeah. you because that's the whole thing with. But that's the principle behind playing a lower quality fiddle when you're learning is that you have to do more to get the sound out. Same as bows, you know. You pay better yeah. money for a bow because you work less. But when you're wor learning, the work is important. You see what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Yep. So just I keep that in much. mind. But definitely something like I described would serve you well. Yes, Judy. Oh. Um, yes, you mentioned um, the signpost. Is there anywhere else you can recommend for uh, maybe a new bow or um, strings? 
Yeah, also, I would always recommend Heinel. I love George Heinel. It's oh, a great I, place. I, know. I thought you said Heinel. Sorry, Heinel. <laughs> yeah, Heinel. George Heinel. They've moved. They're now on uh, on uh, Parliament Street, I think. Parliament and and Dundas or something. Like, or College. Parliament and, and College. But uh, they're really nice people there, and they love fiddle players there. Uh, and in fact, and the guy, Andreas, who works behind the counter, I've known him for years, he sold me my first real nice bow. Like, it is, this is not like the nicest bow. This is about a $900 German bow. Um, I call it my big fat German because she's a little heavier than, than my, the, the French bow that they have there that they loan out that I love. It's my favorite bow ever. It's from 1850. It's a Lamy from France. I call her Yvette. I could hold that thing with a boxing glove and drag it across the strings and it would still sound good, you know. Uh, but anyway, the guy Andreas, he knows every fiddle ever made and almost every bow. He'll take one look at your fiddle and tell you exactly where it came from and how much it's worth. And like I said, they love fiddle players. So when Tommy Peoples came to town, the great Irish fiddle player, to play for the Chris Langan weekend, Andreas heard about it and invited him into the vault where they have the million dollar strads and Guaneris. And him and my friend Jim McGee had a whole afternoon in there playing the fiddles. So I think that's pretty nice. So also they have a huge stock they, they were the first violin store in Toronto. They have so many violins in the range that Nancy is talking about. And they have so many bows in the $500 to $1,000 range or even the $200 range that, you know, you'll always find what you're looking for there. Okay, so that's why I recommend the place. All right. Anyway, so there you go, Nancy. <laughs> nice job with the bowing. So anyway, with that in mind, with a little bit of weight at the top of the up bow, and with a little bit of weight to stop in the middle, let's try it once more, okay? And then we're going to do the jiggle and the, uh, and the uh, little circles. Okay, so down, up, up. Ready? Here we go. Oops, I forgot to do two, and it's good practice. We should do it. Ready, go. the jiggle fresh and just to remind you we're trying to do it in time so one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a see that so try to do that kind of a, a timed out pattern there okay try it again ready two three go Tune up real quick. Jeez, my fiddle was sharp big time because of how rainy it is today. 
that's what happens to your fiddle when it's a rainy day, the whole thing gets a little bigger. And that means that your strings stretch and your fiddle will be sharp, especially your E string. So you always gotta watch out on humid days. You take your fiddle out, always check the tuning because the damn thing moves around like crazy. I saw this crazy YouTube video where a guy took a violin and he put it on a piece of white paper and he put a mark at one end with a black magic marker and a mark at the other end and then he humidified the room overnight. The next morning he comes in and the fiddle is bigger. You can see that it's gone a little bit past the mark. See that? So that's what happens uh, in the moist weather. Anyway, so now let's try the circles. And we'll do uh, eight of them on each string. So that's kind of, you know, two bars of them on each string, okay? Ready, two, here we go. circles all right cool anybody have any problems or questions doing that you getting a decent sound or are you getting most still mostly crunch anybody decent sound that's good so let's now try going the other direction so we're going to do it like this see that so down up down up and it'll be more challenging but it'll be worth it oh one two three uh. Is that more challenging? Do you find that a little bit more challenging than doing just the one direction? Yeah? No, you find it fine, Sherry? That's good. How about you, Nancy? Just, uh, I find it harder to hold on to the bow. I'm struggling a little bit sometimes holding on to the bow or, or making sure that I'm in control of it. It, it, can, um, it can get away from me. And even kind of crampy hands too uh, on some of them so the back and forth is is harder to hold on to it for me than than even just okay anyway i'm, I'm still exploring that that how to how to grip that bow in in the best way well i'm glad you mentioned that because it's really important <laughs> because when you're when you're doing the momentary like that you kind of want to get to know the bow so that you let that momentum that you're talking about actually happen see what i mean uh, so yeah. rather than getting in the way of it, you're going to facilitate it in a clean way. All right. So when I'm bouncing the bow like that, I'm letting it bounce. It's, it's bouncing. So it's, it's like truly bouncing. Give Is me it? a little bit. Okay. Of it. Yeah, it's truly bouncing. Watch me do it again. Yep. See that? And I feel the string go down just like the floorboards of my treehouse that I made when I was 10 when you stepped on them and I feel it come back up. See that? And I feel the resistance of that string and I feel that the bow wants to do it for me. And so yeah. if you're sensitive enough and you get the timing right then that can really work for you. And then you can do stuff like this. 
See that? That's just like, that's what? not me doing it, right? That's just me letting the bow bounce across the four strings. And it's just that through practice and noticing, I know that if I do this, then it'll bounce on those strings on its own just right, and I won't have to get in the way. Yeah, okay. Now, the right. fact that you told me you're getting a little bit crampy means that you might be getting in the way a tiny bit. Yeah. And yeah. if you feel like I, the bow's good, yep. I, I'm still kind of experimenting and going back and forth between the the old Suzuki kind of what what you said in the holding the um, under right the, the frog, the, the frog, yeah, um, versus putting it um, under the proper the way. So I'm back and forth still, um, but. Yeah, maybe I just need to loosen it up a little bit too. Now, I was going to say, if you feel like the bow's going to fall out of your hand, that's always a good sign. Because just like I was telling you about when we did the spider crawl, remember sure. that? Yeah. yeah. And the bow push-ups is that the, the bow should be loose in there, right? It should be sitting yeah. on the top of your fingertips so that you can do that. Okay? So that's a good sign. Try not to get in the way of it too much. I know that it feels a little out of control, but just keep at it until it starts to make that nice sound on its own. Okay. Okay? Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say about doing the, do, going back and forth like that? No? Let's do it again then. All right. Oh, one, two, here we go. I'm going to mention one more bowing pattern that can be very handy. And down in the States, they call it hokum bowing. And uh, 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 for the kids, we, we used to call it hop bunny, hop bunny. <laughs> and it looks like this. short short long short short down up down up down up and it's a very handy bowing pattern for fiddle music we use it all the time whether you're doing that kind of fiddling or even just regular Scottish and Irish it comes in really handy okay so we call it hop bunny hop bunny hop bunny and or they call it the hokum bowing Okay, so anyway, let's give it a try. So we're gonna start on the G string. We're gonna go down, up, down, up, down, up on each string. So that's a down one, a downity, and an uppity on each string, okay? Ready, and. <laughs> problems you get the idea you get the concept yeah that's good let's do it again one two here we go
right? I had a nice whistle on the E string there, always fun. Okay, so that's the, the hokum bowing or the hop buddy hop buddy. So you can give that a whack too. Now, you know, of course, you don't have to do all these bowing patterns every day, but having a variety is really good for you. It gives you something else to do when you pick up your fiddle. And remember, you can always do them on your scales or anything else you're doing really. In the, in the uh, strings across the sky method, they do it on uh, boil the cabbage. <laughs> chicken bowing at the end there which I think is pretty funny and it's because they have this fried chicken place there in Wick Wemacong that's like famous and it is really good chicken but anyway so they call that the chicken bowing <laughs> also really good to do all those things are so good to do and having a, a tune like that boil the cabbage or some simple tune to do it on is really good too all right now let's practice our scales let's go through our one octaves and then we'll do our big two octave and we'll do the arpeggio, okay? So G to begin with. Re oh no, let's start with A. It's a little easier. We'll start with A. Ready, A. Just do the two. Uh, we'll do the two octave G now. All right, right up to E two. Ready? Here we go. sounded but it looked pretty nice and confident and so I'm hoping that it sounded good how's everybody doing with their intonation are you able to keep your eye on it are you able to match me pretty good yeah for the most part why don't we do that two octave scale one more time just to be sure ready and <clears throat>
Again, like I said, very confident looking bows. However, I believe no one, and so I'd love to hear it from somebody so I can keep my ear on you and make sure you're all getting up there. Who would like to give it a shot for me? Sherry already, or no, Katya already tried it. Anybody want to give it a try, G major and two octaves? Let's hear it, Joanne. I can't hear you for some reason. Damn technology. Won't even let you play a scale, God sakes. Well, somebody want to try it while Joanne works that works it out in the meantime? Who who wants to give it a try? Nancy looks ready. Let's hear it, Nancy. Okay. Still having trouble with, with uh, finding the right place, but And what are you I using think, there? What are you using? I got a little pillow that I made. <laughs> Just awesome. to give it a little something. It helps a bit. I, but the other thing, just really quickly, sorry. It's all right. Um, about chin, pos, chin rest position. Yes. So, is do you think it's worth uh, just uh, trying a different chin rest position? Like I'd have to buy another chin rest, right, to yeah. make it to put it over the the. Uh, that's sorry, an, I don't know my parts. Yeah, that's a tail piece. And uh, yeah. so, okay, so there's a few different kinds of chin rests you can get, right? You, can, you have the one that's just got a little tiny overhang of, a, they call that a hook there, over the right. tail piece and a nice little hook. You got a nice little hook at the other side too, okay? Right. Um, you can also get a middley. That's what you're describing, the one that goes right over the middle of the tail piece. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you can also get the one that I love, which is the... Uh, the one that goes right over the whole tail piece. See that? I see. Yeah. So you kind of bo almost both. That... Well, it's not a middley. It's still a, it's still on the left. You know the okay. the chin rest. But this the but it it, may, it means that it can be really close to the tail piece. It okay. shifted a little. Okay. Yeah, and also I love this hump here. It's ebony. It feels beautiful, <laughs> uh, and it hooks under my collarbone or my my uh, jawbone here, and it does so much of the holding for me. That little that little lump there. Like if it wasn't there, then I would have a lot more of this here happening. See that? Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. what I like. But lots of people like the middley. I know many people that like the middley. It does mean okay. that you're kind of. I don't like it at all, <laughs> and, but I find that it's because it puts the fiddle kind of in the middle of my shoulder. It's a weird, it feels really unnatural to me. I never used a middley my entire life, you know, okay. so, and my brother right. didn't and my dad didn't. We've all got, we all had the over that the one. over the tailpiece and clearly here's dad's fiddle, same thing. Okay. See that? All so right. we've always used those, but you, you don't have to buy... You can go to, say, Heinel, and they'll let you try them out. I see. Okay. And you, that and, would be good. Yeah. So you just put different ones on there until you until you find, like I say, it's never comfortable. So you got to find your cleanest, dirty shirts and go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what is? I, did I show you the Everest? Did I show you guys the Everest shoulder rest? Yeah, and and that's what I tried to mimic because I have bought the Coom. Yeah. But I I think it. It does make a little bit of a difference having that more padded. Um, I think I have bony shoulder uh, collarbone yeah. that stick out, and and so more yeah. padding. Yeah, yeah, and I think the Everest would be the perfect thing for you because it's got a pad like that on it. Um, yeah. the, that's a, that's a good fixer upper there that what you got going, <laughs> like your little your little uh, hack or whatever. But the only thing I've noticed about hacks is that they tend to fall apart. Uh, oh, sure. And while you're using it, which is never good, like, you know, I used to make the joke about the old con, they always come off while you're playing, which is really <laughs> annoying, you know? Uh, so the, sometimes hacks like that tend to do that. So that's why, I, you know, you might try an Everest. 
I'll, I'll invest. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's hear your scale. <laughs> All good questions, though. Okay, so pretty good, pretty good. On the way up, your lower octave was quite good. And this is a very common problem for people to, to have a tendency on one octave of the scale and then a different one on another octave of the scale, okay? So on the lower part of the scale, you did quite well. Like I was watching my tuner, you were very, very within the ballpark for most of the notes, right? When you got to the upper octave, you got a little bit flat, Flatsville, USA, all right? And I saw your hand claps. That's that's what I noticed right away. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you went from this kind of nice shape to this when you went over to the A and the E. Now, you see how that can fool you into thinking you've moved your fingers over to the A and the E. Yeah. But what happens is they come down in a weird spot. So you don't want to do that. You want to move the whole elbow. Or... For some people that I teach, they don't even have to move at all. They just reach over with their fingers to that E string with this nice shape here, and it all works out to almost the first try they're in tune. Okay? So pay attention to your hand, make sure you're not collapsing, and see if you can get those E string notes just from your regular A string position. Okay. Okay? Oh, but, Thanks. but, I will say, also, the bow problems you had, touching other strings and stuff, and, and, and yeah. because you put yourself yeah. out of tune with your bow at one point. On your G, your D3, your first attempt at it was in tune, and then you kind of heaved into it and made it flat. Flat. And it's all because of the wandering elbow. Okay. Okay. Tuck that in. Okay. Yes. Anybody else want to give yeah. us that scale? No? Let's do it again then. Oh, Joanne, you got your work, you got your thing worked out? Oh, no, I still can't hear you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. It might be a Bluetooth thing, you know? Sometimes the uh, Bluetooth interferes with uh, stuff, everything. <laughs> okay, let's do it again together, guys. Two octave scale, and then we'll do the arpeggio, and then we'll get back to work on the swallowtail. Ready, G. That feeling good? Okay, good. Let's do the arpeggio, shall we? Anybody remember which ones? Do I need to call out the numbers and letters, or can we just do it? 
I better call them out. <laughs> okay, we start on open G and then it's going to be a B or a 2. Ready? G. B, 2. Open D. G, 3. A, 1. B. A, 3. D. E, 2 close to G. Back to the D. Back to the B. Back to the G. Open. G2. And open. Okay, let's do it again right away now that you've all figured it out. <laughs> Ready? And. Did that go a little better? Yeah? All right, now who's going to give me that one to make sure you're getting it? Sherry's ready, I can tell. Here we go, here we go. Okay, now really, really good job. On the, you have the opposite problem of, uh, of uh, Nancy there. You had your lower octave was a little bit sharp. Your upper octave was really good. Okay, really good. Your high G, however, that E2, that problematic note, was quite flat. And that's kind of the usual when you first start trying to get that note is that you kind of squish the fingers together, you know? But you have to pay attention to the low two for everybody. Everybody's hand is different. For some people, this is what my teacher used to tell, my dad's teacher used to say, for some people to get the high G in tune, your fingers have to be touching. For some people, they have to be not touching. For some people, they have to be what they call occasionally touching. Do you see what I mean by that? There's three kind of levels there. And all you got to do is just discover which one you are. Make sure your F sharp is nice. Put down your G in the really close or touching position. See if it's flat. If it is, you're not one of those people. Okay. And you give a little gap. If that, however, when you give the gap, if that's sharp, then you're probably going to be one of those occasionally touching people, which is most people. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, but the lower octave, like I said, was good, but I should say your B, the low B, uh, the second time down was very sharp. Okay, so B is a hard one. Keep your eye on it. Keep your ear on it. It's a pain. Okay, anybody else want to play me that arpeggio so I can keep my ear on you? Did you work out your problem there, Joanne? Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. <laughs> you want to play the arpeggio for me? I can try it. All right. I was fiddling there, trying to get in and out of that, but anyway. Sure. That was really good, Joanne. Really good. All you guys, like, I am really impressed at how you're getting along with this. I swear to God, I think Zoom is better. 
because <laughs> if this is a typical be beginner class, at least two people would play me the arpeggio and not even notice they were at a tune, flat as piss on a plate the whole time, and then look at me with this face like, was that good? But this is different. You guys are all kind of getting, I'm giving you all like a 70% of the notes are really nicely in tune. So keep up that real careful work, that mindful work. I will tell you, Joanne, your high G, you had the opposite problem of Sherry. You were really sharp. Okay. So if you had a gap, I don't know. Do you remember if you had a gap or not? Um... Don't know. So the next time you try it, you're going to try to pay attention to that. If you do have a gap, it might be too much of a gap. You could be one of these touching people. You know, it depends on how big your fingers are. Jerry Holland had great big giant sausage fingers. And he used to say that sometimes he would have to kind of get his first finger out of the way to put his second finger down. Okay? So you really, for all of you guys, you really just have to pay attention. The close position... That's your only reference, so you just got to figure out what kind of person you are. T touching, occasionally touching, or gap. All right, let's try the arpeggio once more. Okay, ready, and... Okay, that looked pretty confident. Everybody feel good about that? Yeah? Okay, we'll go with it then. Now, so we were working on the swallowtail. Can you remind me, did we do the second part? Did we do the B part? So we did the whole thing? Wow, awesome. Okay, so Sherry played it for me. Katya played it for me, did a great job. Anybody else want to play it for me before we start practicing and grinding away at it? I'll play it, Dan. I Yay! Yep. Yeah. I have a question on the B section. Okay. Um, of the slurs. Um, <clears throat> in the first bar, I'm doing an up uh, slur uh, from the E to the F, right? Yep. Yeah. On the second uh, bar, I'm not sure whether I do it from the E to the F or the F to the next E. On one it would be a down, a down slur and on the other it would be an up. You should do them both. For the swallowtail it works out really good and it's good practice. Watch this. See, it works out. It really works out well. Okay. Does that make so sense? A, an up and a down? Yeah. So look, yeah. here's the up one, here's the down one, and then we got back to regular. Here's the up one. See what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear it, Elaine. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. 
right on a lane. Very good. One little stumble. That's great. Thank you. Because you've been working hard on that, you know. Yeah. Elaine's been working on going through a two with no stumbles. It's like a personal vendetta mission, which I entirely approve of. And that was great. Now, I was going to say, I think your E-string is flat. Okay, so you might want to check the tuning on it there before okay, we carry on. Just play it for me because I could be wrong. No, it just slightly, but so that means that you were a bit sharp there on the upper end. Okay. Great, great northern migration. But anyway, it's no big deal. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Okay, great. That's great. Anybody else want to try playing it? Judy, you, want, you look like you're ready. Want to give it a try? You want to try playing it for us? Yeah. Oh, you got to unmute. Excellent. So that I just say I've played for several years following no I know I know this is the first thing I've ever played by ear. Oh geez, you're doing excellent then. That sounds really good. Yeah. And like I said, don't worry about the staggers because it's nothing a few hundred times won't, won't fix, you know? Um, and also you skipped a little bit in the in the B part the first time around But you can just say what my dad used to say when he rolled through a stop sign. I stopped there yesterday. Don't worry about it Anyway, let's take the grinder to it shall we let's do it a couple of hundred times here and get it get it working I was gonna say also Judy a little bit flat for the most part But I think it's just because you were not bringing in your usual pressure on your left hand because sometimes when you go to play a tune, like when you just kind of go for it and play a tune, that's the first thing that suffers is the finger pressure, which brings you up into tune, okay? So I find that if you just press harder across the board, that'll bring you up into tune, okay? So let's give it a go. Okay, here we go, guys. Nice and easy. Ready, and...
Okay, now by the looks of it, look pretty good. How are we feeling? Are everybody able to play at that tempo? Was the tempo okay? Sherry? Um, I'm not used to it playing that fast, so I just would lose my space and then just catch up to you when I knew it. So That's the perfect I'm, approach. I'm glad that I could find a spot and jump back in. Yes, and you know, that's the virtue of learning the tune by the phrases. Because if you know the phrases, the beginnings of them, then you have a chance of jumping in on them. You know, and that's a really good approach. That's how I learned all the Irish here in Toronto was just jumping in like that over and over. Jumping into the jumping rope, you know what I mean? Over and over and over and over until I was just in there constantly. But we'll do it slower if you want. It's always good practice to do it slower. Can I share a little trick that I kind of learned this week? Sure. So I was all concerned about my neighbors downstairs because they can hear everything up here, okay? so Lucky them. <laughs> so I was thinking, what, they must just be hearing squeaks all the time. So when I was playing, I actually was singing, squeak, 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 squeak. And it took, it took my head out of the game, so my hands knew what to do, because my head wasn't thinking so hard. Wow, cool. Yeah, I thought that was worth sharing. Well, and you know what? You, it does remind me of a Suzuki trick that they get the kids to do, where they get them to, to sing the name of the note that they're playing while they're playing it. And I'm going to tell you, it's a strengthener. I try to do it when I'm teaching. I can't really get through. I can only get so far. But uh, you could give that a try. But singing the note you're playing is so good for your ear. So keep doing it. That's a really good idea. Now, anybody else find that tempo too fast? Anybody? Well, I'm going to make you do it slower anyway. <laughs> Katya? Uh, so, um, you played it faster than in your slow video. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, the, the slow version of the YouTube video, which, which is excellent for practicing. I can't tell you how... Uh, good that is. That's good. First of all, just in future, just leave a couple more seconds in the beginning to to um, start because there's like 1.5 seconds. Oh really? Oh okay, I'll pay attention to that. Nice and slow. <laughs> And I'm always struggling to start with the song. Okay, all right, good to know. No, so, but the video is slower. Okay, so yes. that tells me this then. So here's what I want to know. This is really precious information. What went wrong when we went fast? Okay, what about you, Katya? What was the first thing that went wrong? Um, as soon as I'm out of, uh, as I'm missing one beat, then I'm thrown off and it's very hard for me to get back into it. So that bugs me a lot because really if I play it very slow, Lee, then it's okay, but as soon as the speed um, yeah. is taken up and once I miss a beat, then it's like, well, where, where were we kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, now, that's a totally normal process. That that have, That's exactly what Sherry was talking about, too, you yes. know. And, and like I was saying to her, just keep jumping back in there. Are you and, able to jump back yes. in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's good then. And... And the other thing is too the the slur. Sometimes I I lose the tempo. Kind of uh, I'm I'm noticing that I'm speeding up. Yeah. Some parts, especially if there's this short note, you know, like the slur. Yeah. Um, I also have to keep uh, the bow on the string. I like to just go whoop <laughs> from the string, which is not good because then I have to put it back down. Kind of of course, yeah. You never you want to pick it up, the pick up the bow at a minimum. But I was going to say about those long note slurs things, right? That nine times out of ten you're just cutting off the long note short. Okay. And if yeah. you do it in this tune, if you do it to each one, see that you can really yeah. get ahead of you because when you do that, when you cut off those quarter notes, it's exponential. And so before you know it, you're way ahead of me. Oh uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, so the, the tempo of the, the video, 
plate is borderline for me. Borderline. Okay, and what went wrong was the was the cutting off the long it notes. Do it. But it's borderline, yeah. And 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 uh, uh, being thrown off. So that's really good information. What about somebody else? What went wrong at that tempo? Because since it was different than the rec than the video, what went wrong at that tempo? Yep. Yeah. So I started hitting the wrong strings. Wandering elbow. Now here's what happens when you go a little faster. For some people, for a lot of people, the right arm tenses up. So you go from this to this. See that? And that means that elbow's in the game. And that means that it's heaving your bow from one string to the other if you don't want it to or not. All right? So you got to relax when you're going fast. It's the most important time to relax and all that kind of stuff that athletes say. <laughs> okay? Yeah, that's all that it is, though. So, oh, but you can you can dominate that by doing the doorway. That always helps. Like, if you want to try the faster tempo, stick that elbow in the doorway. might work out for you. Okay? Anybody else want to tell me what happened when we went fast there? Okay, let's try it slow. All right? Nice and dead slow. Ready? And...
Success? Any casualties? <laughs> what happened to you, Nancy? Well, you know, I'm on the part B. Yeah. I, I can't read, apparently, and I can't count because I was throwing an extra, uh, an extra, I can't slur, but I was doing extra. <laughs> Yeah, it, right. It doesn't take much, but uh, yeah. So I'll just I'll have to count that properly um, now. Yeah, um, that's the you know those those repeated things like it's always it's always the danger. The thing is though, one thing to remember: the faster we go, the easier that gets. Because when you're plodding through it, it's like, how many times have I done it? I forgot. I started thinking about something else. <laughs> yeah. So the, when you go faster, you actually hear the melody. It's like you don't have it's, to remember that. You don't have to work that out. It'll fit in. It'll okay. fit in. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. So just keep, just try to pay attention for now. But when we pick up the tempo, I think you'll find that a little bit easier. Okay. Okay. Anybody else having any problems with the faster, little tiny bit faster there? No? All good? Okay, so with that tune, just keep grinding away at it with the 220 grit until it starts to come together, okay? And uh, let's think about uh, another tune, all right? Now, I'd like to try a reel. I'd like to, the next thing I'd like to do is a reel, and then after that, I think it may, might be fun to do a song, a song melody, all right? And it's a big thing there in a lot of traditions. And I, I have found it very useful with the, with the kids up in Wiki to, to try to play familiar songs. So one of, the, one of the things that's really awesome to do is to take a song that you know in your head, like You Are My Sunshine or Amazing Grace is one that a lot of people have good success with, and try to work it out on your fiddle, all right? So you sing it in your head, and then you pick a starting note, and I'll tell you, for Amazing Grace, the best key to do it in is the key of A, all right? And that means that the first note of Amazing Grace is not actually beat one, right? It's the pickup note. So the ah uh from Amazing is actually a pickup note, and it's going to be a low E. So that's the D1. And then the actual first note, the beat one, the maze of amazing is going to be an A. Okay, now that's just a little hint. <laughs> and I'll let you work out for the rest from there. It can be very strengthening to your ear to work out a familiar song on your fiddle. And we can do it in a couple of keys, but A is a very good starting key to try this in. Okay, so that's going to be a little bit of homework that you can play around with. But let's think about a reel to do. Okay, now the Swallowtail is an Irish tune. I feel like maybe we should do a Scottish one for a reel. What do you, or do you have any preference? Scottish would be good, eh? Gotta love that. Tart, a bit of tartan for you. Bit of haggis. Only a bit though, nobody ever wants a whole plate of haggis, believe me. Anyway, so let's see, we got a few options here. The, the, the first tune in Sandy McIntyre's book I'm gonna show you. Oh, whoops. Let's see here. So this is Sandy McIntyre's book. Everybody see that? That's what it looks like. Now it's kind of hard to get these days, especially since poor Sandy is back in Sydney in the uh, uh, constant care home in Sydney there because uh, he had a real hard time over the spring and Brian thought that that was the best place for him because Nova Scotia is COVID free. <laughs> so he's there and he's not doing great and so it's really hard to, to find this copy of the book. 
But if you want to borrow mine, anybody that wants to borrow mine, please let me know. You can come and pick it up on my porch. And the rule about Sandy's book is that you're supposed to, if you borrow it, you're supposed to make two photocopies. One for you and one for the next person that you hand it over to. That's the rule. So anybody that wants to borrow this book and make a copy of it, you're more than welcome to. Uh, except that you got to do that rule of making another copy to pass it on to somebody else. Okay? It's an extremely, extremely good collection of Cape Breton and Scottish music. And there's some Irish in there too. All right? It's everybody plays all of these tunes. Any one of them, you, you put your finger on it and everybody at the session will be able to play it. Okay? Also, he's chosen really good old versions from good sources good books that are reliable and so you don't have to muck around with the versions you can say listen man it's in sandy's book is the, like this here is from the thousand fiddle tunes book all this stuff here which is a great source for tunes and very reliable the versions here are open-ended they're meant to be changed according to the player and they're very very reliable you'll run into the same version at most of the sessions you go to so very excellent book to have now and it's also his method so I'm going to look at his idea for the first tune of the book. I think I know what it is already. And I'm right. It is Mrs. McLeod's Reel. That's what it looks like there. It's from the Sky Collection, which is another great book that I happen to have right here. Elaine will recognize this title because this is like everybody's got this on their shelf in Cape Breton. And if anybody has a dispute about a version, it is quickly retrieved and referenced. <laughs> and in fact, this is the book that most people learn from. And my dad couldn't, his, his uncle who brought him up couldn't afford uh, to buy the book. And so he did this. Even though he didn't know how to read music or anything about it, he copied out the tunes from the Sky Collection by hand. You see that? It's amazing, and luckily I still have it. And the nice thing about it is, of course, you couldn't get all of the tunes in the Sky Collection. That'd be a big job. So we just got the hits. He just got the ones that everybody really liked back in the 40s and early 50s, which is totally cool. But anyway, so that's where this version comes from of Mrs. McLeod's Reel. And so it is really reliable. It's not quite the way you know, everybody plays it, but it's easily adaptable, okay? And I'll certainly send this out to everybody uh, so you can have a look at it. But just like for tonight, I just want to get familiar with it. I want to tell you about it and uh, where you can find it, and, and I'll make a recording for you, and, and uh, then we'll talk about the challenges, okay? So first of all, I'll, I'll play it for you a couple times. It certainly was one of the first tunes I ever learned. McLeod's real. Thank you very much. Now, so I played that in the way that my family's uh, band used to play it, and not much different than what Sandy's version is there. But there's a everybody plays this tunes. This tune in Ireland, they play it. They play it in G. <laughs> That's 
because Illin pipes really do not like A. <laughs> they can't play a G sharp unless they have a key, and even when they do have a key, those fellas don't like to press that key very much at all. And so I think that's why they play it in G, and it's slightly different again. It's much more melodic. And then the old-timey guys down in the States, they play it too. Uh, and it has a different sound altogether. See that? Different altogether. But anyway, it's one of these universal pan celtic and old-timey tune you know so a very very good one to have under your belt it's in the key of a so before playing this tune it's a very good idea to practice that key because it's different uh on the upper register uh than uh than what we're used to in the swallowtail and so because we're going to have to play a high two all right on the a string and the e string as you remember from the scale so it's a change and whenever you have a change from what you're used to on your hand it takes some getting used to so going up and down the scale before you try the tune is a really good idea and familiarizing yourself with the key of a this week spending a little bit more time on it would be really good like for instance you could figure out the arpeggio <laughs> now that's just in the upper octave here it is in the lower octave and that's good to practice too but we're not using that for this tune we're using only the upper octave of the key of a and it's a little bit more intuitive to your fingers so so the arpeggio once more is a c which is a2 in the high position e and then A, which is the E3. Back to the E, back to the C sharp, and back to the A. Okay, that's the A major arpeggio. And it would be a good idea to familiarize yourself with that too, especially since this tune is basically a big arpeggio, especially in the second part, all right? Now, in our last few minutes here, I'm going to play this tune slowly so that you can get the sound of it a little bit more in your head. And then I'll, we'll get some questions and stuff like that. And next week we'll start working on it, okay? In the meantime, though, we'll keep working on the swallowtail for you guys. But I'm just going to play this tune nice and easy and uh, so you can get kind of get the more of the sound in your head. phrases and when I learn tunes by ear that's exactly how I do it I listen first for the most repeated phrases usually the ending and I think that's the case in this tune as well yes the ending is, in the, is the same in the A part as in the B part so it would be the most repeated phrase see that so you listen for that listen for the second most repeated start to put together those patterns and you'll have the tune all right now, is there any questions or problems about anything we worked on tonight or that what we're working on next this, this coming week, which is going to be your bowing patterns, 
you're now including the hop bunny, hop bunny, hop bunny, hop bunny. And uh, then the two octave G major scale with the arpeggio. You're now going to be trying to figure out the A major arpeggio. Okay, just in the one octave after you're finished the scale. Always do your arpeggios right after you're finished playing the scale because you've already practiced the notes. You'll have a much better chance of getting them in tune if you played them during the scale, which is a little easier. Okay, so you're going to figure out that A major arpeggio. You're going to practice swallowtail. What you're going to do this week is this is grinding week. Okay, you're going to grind it down. If you have to start with 100 grit, whatever, that's fine. But by the end of it, I want you to be shooting for 220, okay? Which means that we're going to try to pick up the tempo a little bit. And whenever you do that, you're going to try to pay attention to what goes wrong. When I go fast, this happens. And then we can go back to the slow and attack that and overcome it. I, somebody was saying that... Uh, uh, they're easily thrown off by like one note that's off or whatever. I'm going to tell you right now that most of those notes that people miss are the pickup notes of each phrase. So the little note that comes right before phrase two or when you go to repeat phrase one, that little pickup note, those are where everybody gets hitched up. So you can spend some extra time listening to those notes and making sure you know them, stuff like that. We're going to get past this hurdle and be able to play this tune a little faster. Okay? Now, any questions or problems with that? Uh, Dan? Yep. Uh, people say there's there's a thing that was four reels are on two pieces of paper. Okay. I, ne I never got that. I'll make sure you get that, Bill. I'll make a note of it. I'll make a note of that right now. Thank you. Okay, Bill needs compiled. Okay, I'll make sure you get that. Anybody else having any problems with anything? Okay, well that's great. So we got a good job of homework this week there, guys. And uh, and I will I will record Miss McLeod's for you. I'll do it regular speed. I'll do it slow. I'll make note, I'll listen to the swallowtail and make sure I do a similar slow tempo. Uh, and because uh, this is a little different now, that's that, that swallowtail is a jig in six eight time, and now we're doing a reel, which is four four time. So it's different, right? Um, and the bowing is going to be different as well. So I'll record it fast. I'll record it really slow. Make sure it's comparable, and I'll also take a picture of this music from Sandy's book, and and post that as well. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, great. Any other problems or questions or concerns or queries? No? Yes, Joanne. Um, I will say that I what I find is the slow is too slow for me, and the fast is too fast. Yeah, I know what you mean. Now, I can do a medium. I adjust, I try to adjust the playback speed. So that I can play. Oh, that's good. And you got like the amazing slow downer or something like that? Well, I just do it on YouTube. It has a you can do it right on YouTube. Oh, and it doesn't affect the pitch? Well, I don't know. Maybe it does. <laughs> a little I, bit maybe, but Okay. I didn't know you I didn't know you could do that on YouTube, but I do know about this thing called the amazing slow downer. It's an app. And it's, I don't use it, but, but a lot of people use it on me. <laughs> and it's this thing, it's an amazing thing. You can do videos or audio and you play at half speed or whatever speed you want and it doesn't affect the pitch. Okay. Because I can do a medium version, but I, you know, my experience with doing medium versions is that it never pleases everybody. The, the medium, the gap between slow and fast, that's a huge kind of thing, right? So the medium could be anywhere in there. So using the amazing slowdowner would probably be even more control than me trying to do a medium version. Okay, I'll, just, I'll try that out. Oh, but I'll tell you that in the, in the people that I know that use the amazing slowdowner on me, they say it's a lot easier to slow down my fast to play along with than it is to speed up my slow because I still can't help it. I try when I play slow to do everything this new way I normally do when I'm fast, but there's a lot of things that does, that can't possibly happen because there's momentum involved when you go fast, right? So people say it sounds more true to life when they slow down the fast rather than speeding up the slow. 
Okie dokie. Everybody good and happy? And thank you to Katya who sent me November's payments. Awesome. Thank you very much. And you can send those along and we'll see everybody next week. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.